Can I remind members of the COVID-related measures that are in place and that face coverings should be worn when moving around the chamber and across the Holyrood campus? The next item of business is a stage one debate on motion 2234 in the name of Hamza Youssef on the Transvaginal Mesh Removal Cost Reimbursement Scotland Bill. And I would invite members who wish to speak in the debate to press their request to speak buttons now. And I call on Hamza Youssef to speak to and move the motion. Ten minutes, Cabinet Secretary. Thank you very much, Presiding Officer. I'm pleased to open the debate on Transvaginal Mesh Removal Cost Scotland Bill. I'd first like to thank the Health, Sport and Social Care Committee, uh, so ably convened by Gillian Martin, MSP, and to all the members for their thoughtful consideration of the Bill, uh, for their report and, of course, importantly, for their support for the general principles of this Bill. I'm also very grateful to the Finance and Constitution Committee and the Delegate Powers and Law Reform Committees for their consideration of the Bill also. I also want to take this opportunity to thank everyone who has taken time to express their views on the Bill in evidence to the Committee or indeed to me uh, directly. In particular, I would like to, take, uh, like to thank a number of affected women who have taken part in focus groups about the Bill. I know every single member will agree with me when I say it is because of the courage of the women affected that we are at this very point. But it should not have taken them to have to retell their own stories. But I am grateful to all those women who have, over the years, shared their experience and helped to shape uh, this bill. Uh, it would also be churlish of me not to recognise uh, the excellent cross-party efforts that have highlighted the plight of these women in particular, uh, to highlight the contributions of Jackson Carlaw, uh, Alex Neil, and, uh, of course, uh, Neil Findlay, uh, as well, the latter two, of course, who uh, are no longer uh, in this parliament. Uh, Presiding officer, the, the bill the government presents today is a, a narrow bill uh, with a limited function, which in all likelihood will be directly relevant to only a very few people. However, it would be equally fair to say that the impact on those very few people would be very, very significant indeed. It brings the Parliament's attention back to the traumatic experiences of a substantial number of women in Scotland who have suffered pain and distress after having mesh implanted. Many of us have heard directly from women about the physical symptoms, but also the mental distress they suffered, which was often made worse because they felt that their experiences were simply not taken seriously enough when they sought help. The government and the NHS are working now to improve the care we offer those women. In particular, there is now in Glasgow a National Specialist, Specialist Mesh Removal Service, which has been offering a full mesh removal since July 2020, and so far it has provided 33 women uh, with mesh removal surgery. At the Glasgow Centre, new surgeons have been recruited, and there are now four urogynecologists, uh, allowing women more choice over who they are treated by, and of course the option to be treated by a surgeon not previously involved in their care. The service also benefits from contributions from dedicated nurses, physiotherapists, pharmacy staff and a clinical psychologist. But let me say clearly and unequivocally, I completely understand that there are a number of women who have lost trust in our NHS. I will work hard, I know the service will work hard too, to rebuild that trust. But I also know from having talked to a number of mesh survivors that they feel that that trust is broken beyond repair and I am uh, sorry for that. Alongside the National Specialist Service, the government and the NHS are also working to make it possible for women to be referred to surgery in NHS England and also in the independent sector. Therefore, women seen at the National Centre who do not want surgery in NHS Scotland will have the choice to be referred to a specialist centre in England or indeed to independent providers. I announced in July, of course, that two providers, Spire Healthcare in Bristol and the Mercy Hospital in Missouri, have been selected to provide these choices. Since the summer, NHS Scotland services have been working to finalise contracts. NSS has, in particular, been seeking to make sure that arrangements for surgery are supported by other services that will meet emergency and wider medical needs. I do appreciate that the wait since July has undoubtedly been frustrating for women who have already had to wait a considerable period of time. But I hope the Parliament will agree that it is essential to have all the right care in place, particularly when women may have to travel some considerable distance. Presiding officer, I know I have now spent a little time talking, a fair bit of time talking about matters outside of the scope of the bill, but I know these issues are important uh, to the women affected and indeed I think to members right across the chamber. 
While arrangements for referral to the independent sector uh, planned, uh, with arrangements uh, to the independent sector uh, planned, it seemed to the government right to reimburse women who have already and already had arranged uh, removal privately, paying, uh, of course, from their own pocket. Uh, the bill before the Parliament therefore gives ministers power to reimburse the costs borne by women who in the past have entered into private arrangements for transvaginal mesh removal surgery. Uh, section 1 of the bill establishes that power. It gives power to reimburse the costs of the person who underwent the surgery and those of a companion uh, where there was one. Section 1 and 2 together give the power for the government to develop a scheme by which payment be made and for that scheme to be laid before the Parliament and published. Uh, presiding officer, let me now turn to some of the issues raised in the report by the committee, which I responded to on Monday. The committee proposed that women who had mesh implanted in Scotland, but who then arranged to have it removed, having moved out of Scotland, should be eligible for reimbursement. Uh, the government agrees with this view in principle and will therefore table appropriate amendments at stage two. The committee has also asked the government to consider whether there might be some change to the cut-off date before which arrangements for private surgery have to have been made uh, in order to be eligible for reimbursement. The date is proposed at present to be the 12th of July of this year because that's the date the government confirmed which providers have been selected as preferred bidders to provide surgery in the independent sector. However, I did promise to reflect on this matter further and I will do so uh, in absolutely good faith. I have explained in the government's response that I will consider whether it is reasonable now to adjust that date, and I will confirm uh, the government's position at stage two. Uh, presiding officer, I have also considered the committee's implicit recommendation that the reimbursement scheme be made in regulation. On this, I should say that the government is not convinced that making the scheme in regulations would involve further delay for women who have already had to wait, as we all acknowledge, in some cases, years for reimbursement, I'm not convinced that in this case the merits of greater parliamentary scrutiny outweigh the priority of offering assistance to the women involved as quickly as possible. But I do, of course, appreciate that members uh, and, and the committee, of course, will want to understand how the scheme will operate in practice. So I will make available a draft of the scheme to the committee before stage two uh, if the parliament <clears throat> agrees to the bill today, as I suspect uh, we will. I hope that the committee finds the government's response to their re report helpful. Uh, constructive, uh, and, uh, and as I've said before, uh, make the, the, the suggestions that I've made and the compromises I hope we've made uh, show our good faith. Uh, I should add that the government will uh, also reflect on this debate today before uh, we take any finalised positions uh, in relation to our stage two amendments. Uh, and I look forward to considering important points of detail uh, with the committee uh, at that stage two debate. Uh, Presiding officer, in closing, let me say that uh, I can only imagine the distress that, 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 that has caused women to use their own funds, often quite considerable uh, amounts of money, to seek private surgery for mesh removal. I've met a number uh, of these women, both in my capacity as Cabinet Secretary for Health and Social Care, but also on a constituency level too. I suspect every single member that is speaking, and in fact I suspect every single member of this parliament has at the very least had correspondence from a constituent, and uh, I'm sure every single one of us uh, have been moved by the plight uh, of these women. It is wrong that women felt that their only option was to dig deep into their pockets, some of them having to take out loans, some of them having to borrow money from friends and family. I think all of us can agree uh, that it is wrong that those women felt that this was their only option. The government is determined to ensure that women never have to feel this way again. Uh, the successive past, successful passage of this bill will put in place a scheme that will make sure that these costs are met and women involved are no longer at a financial disadvantage. I look forward very much to working with colleagues across the chamber to make that uh, reality. I appreciate uh, the cooperation we've had uh, with the committee and its members. I therefore move the general principles of the Transvaginal Mesh Removal Cost Reimbursement Scotland Bill uh, to be agreed to. Thank you. <coughs> I now call on Julian Martin on behalf of the Health, Social Care and Sport Committee. Thank you very much, uh, President Officer. Over the years, we have all heard countless accounts of the complications of transvaginal mesh and its lifelong effects, even after the mesh 
has been fully or partially removed, countless physical damage, countless psychological trauma, and for many, countless years of suffering, uh, both in the past and, and still to come. As the convener of the Health and Social Care and Sport Committee, I'm pleased to speak today on our report on the Transvaginal Mesh Removal Cost Reimbursement Scotland Bill. And up front, I, I want to say that this bill couldn't and doesn't undo the physical or psychological trauma that these women have faced and continue to face as a result of mesh complications. The bill has been introduced for a very specific purpose, as the Cabinet Secretary has just outlined, and we as a committee support that purpose, and that is to reimburse uh, individuals who have paid to have transvaginal mesh removed from their body using private healthcare settings. As a result of their experiences, it is very apparent to anyone who has listened to the women affected that they have lost trust in a system that is meant to care for them. These women have not experienced the compassion, choice and control they should be entitled to expect from that system. In the past, they have not felt empowered to discuss their complications or treatment options or to be actively involved in decisions about their care. And as a result that, of that, many have uh, gone down the road of seeking private treatment. We have heard uh, that the Scottish Government is taking steps to ensure that in the future women will have that choice and control over their care including options to have transvaginal mesh remove sur uh, removal surgery undertaken by independent providers. And we welcome that. The committee considers the key principle of the bill is to ensure fairness for all individuals in relation to transvaginal mesh removal services in Scotland. And it's unfair and unreasonable for women who've already had surgery to, have, uh, to meet the financial costs um, of removal of surgery themselves, when that option will be available to women free of charge in the future. And the bill seeks to rectify this unfairness. The committee supports that intent, and more broadly, we support the general principles underlying the bill. Our report concentrates on areas where we think that, that the bill, as it is currently drafted, might need to be clarified to make sure that it achieves that fairness for the women affected. And in some areas, we have put forward recommendations to strengthen its intent. Before going into detail about those recommendations, I'd like to take a moment to thank all those who assisted the committee in our scrutiny, those who responded to our call for views, and those who gave evidence in person or online. And I would particularly like to thank the women who spoke with us in a private session facilitated by the Health and Social Care Alliance, and they told us about their experiences of transvaginal mesh complications, and we're very grateful to them, and we are in absolutely no doubt how difficult it must be to have to recount those experiences time and again. Evidence from that meeting and in our call for views suggests that there are still areas of uncertainty around the bill and that continues to be a source of some anxiety. In particular, our report recommends that greater clarity is needed around the residency criteria set out in the bill. As it stands, women who were not resident in Scotland at the time of their original uh, mesh surgery, but who lived here when their mesh removal surgery was arranged, would be eligible for reimbursement. But in contrast, women who were resident in Scotland at the time of their original surgery, where the mesh was, was, was used and uh, put into their bodies, but who lived elsewhere when they arranged mesh removal surgery, would not. So the Scottish Government has told us that it has not received any correspondence from women in this situation. However, it also acknowledges that a number of women who may ultimately apply for reimbursement under the Bill is unknown. It is reasonable to assume that the Scottish Government might not have heard from everyone who might be covered by the Bill. And it is also reasonable to assume that there may be some women affected who do not yet know about the Bill. The Committee believes that if it means even just one more woman can be helped, that the bill should be amended to include all those women seeking reimbursement for mesh removal surgery who originally had their mesh implanted by the NHS in Scotland. And that should be irrespective of where they were living when that mesh removal surgery was arranged. We also heard from a number of women describing themselves as the in-betweeners. These are women who are in the process of arranging treatment privately or who are currently waiting for their private surgery to take place. And the introduction of the bill has caused some confusion and concern for these women. In short, they are unsure whether they will be eligible for reimbursement and the additional costs from travel restrictions and delays, uh, particularly imposed by the COVID-19 pandemic, have added to that anxiety. They want reassurance that their costs will be reimbursed if the bill is passed. Now, according to the, the bill, a cut-off date to qualify for reimbursement will be specified 
uh, as part of the details of the scheme. And we're told that that date is likely to be the 12th of July 2021. And the Scottish Government has uh, suggested this would be a date when individuals could be reasonably expected to be aware of the availability of the new specialist mesh service as the preferred route to mesh removal surgery. However, there is a gap between the 12th of July, when the outcome of the procurement exercise for the service was announced, and the conclusion of contracts with independent providers, which currently remain under negotiation. There is a risk, again, that a relatively small number of women will fall through this gap and therefore be judged ineligible for reimbursement. And, and we don't think it's fair that these individuals should be obliged to cover the cost of the surgery themselves. Uh, we thank the Cabinet Secretary for his indication both today and when he was in front of our committee that he is willing to look at this. And we do understand that there cannot be an open-ended period and that there must be an end date, but we'd like that the proposed one reviewed, uh, the proposed one be reviewed given what I've just outlined. Martin Whitfield. I'm very grateful for Gillian Martin to give way, and I very much welcome her very powerful speech in support of this. With regard to the end date, did the committee consider whether or not the date of commission of the alternative methods that are going to be recommended, in fact, should be the cut-off date? Because then women know that there is a certainty um, that there is an alternative route to having the vaginal mesh removed surgically. Julian Martin. Well, well, I guess that's implicit in what, in what I've just said, because we, there is that gap there. We haven't specified what we think the date should be, but we have asked the government to look at it again, just in case there are women, any women caught in that gap. So I, I take your point. And the committee recognises that much of this detail is due to be set out in the scheme itself rather than the face of the bill. And our report highlights areas where we consider a flexible approach is needed to ensure the spirit of fairness is achieved, including how and what costs be uh, reimbursed, what evidence will be required and who can apply. And we hope to see this reflected in the final scheme. As a parliament, we also want to ensure that we're given appropriate opportunities to scrutinise the details of that scheme before it enters into force. And I am very grateful to the Cabinet Secretary for committing to provide the parliament with a draft version of the scheme prior to stage two. And my committee will want to look at details of that draft uh, and to ensure that these reflect the stated objectives of the bill and the underlying principle of fairness. And we realise that this is not something the government is compelled to do by parliamentary process, so we appreciate that extra level of scrutiny that's been offered to us. We have also highlighted areas where we would like to see further clarity for the women concerned and scheme administrators. The process of applying for reimbursement should not cause additional stress and anxiety for those either applying or managing the scheme. And while this bill is not about the specialist mesh removal services, or referral pathways currently in place or under development in Scotland, it is inextricably linked to them. And we've heard that there's still a long way to go to rebuild faith and trust between NHS Scotland and the women affected. So we would like to see public campaigns to publicise the reimbursement scheme created by this bill and the complex mesh national surgical service. And the committee plans to take an, an active interest in both going forward. In conclusion, President Officer, the Committee supports the general principle of the Bill. It is a necessary and important step to ensure fairness for women affected by transvaginal mesh and the breakdown in trust they have experienced during treatment by NHS Scotland. We are very keen to see, ensure this Bill progresses through Parliament quickly uh, to ensure that the women can be reimbursed as soon as possible. I am very grateful to the Cabinet Secretary for having provided such a quick response to our Stage 1 report. And as set out in that response, we look forward to seeing further improvements to the Bill at Stage 2, reflecting our key recommendations. President Officer. Thank you. I now call on Sandesh Gohani. Thank you. And can I point members to my declaration of interest as a practising doctor? It is not every day that parties on opposite sides of the chamber see eye to eye. It is even rarer for us to find common ground twice in one week. Uh, and today, there is every reason why Parliament must stand united. United to fully support Scotland's brave women who have suffered so greatly following complications from transvaginal mesh surgery. The very least we can do together is ensure that any women who receive this treatment in Scotland would be compensated for the money they have paid out for mesh removal surgery, even if treated overseas. Mesh, usually made from synthetic polypropylene, was supposed to reinforce damaged tissue when treating pelvic organ prolapse or stress urinary incontinence, which is usual after childbirth. 
It's a procedure used across Europe uh, and the US and afar since the 90s, but the failure rate associated with this procedure is a gynecological scandal. Complications from mesh include nerve damage, chronic pain, vaginal scarring resulting from the erosion of the product inside the body. There have been cases of organ perforation when the mesh has been exposed inside the vagina and some women have died. As complaints from patients and families turned into lawsuits, authorities around the world began to act and by late 2017, Australia and New Zealand were the first to ban transvaginal mesh. Since 2018, no vaginal mesh implants have been carried out in Scotland. Over a 20-year period, in Scotland alone, over 20,000 women underwent mesh surgery and thousands are believed to have suffered in varying degrees from the effects. Some 600 women resorted to taking legal action. And as the Health Committee has heard in person, and I would like to place on record my thanks to these brave women with harrowing uh, experiences of mesh surgery, and so many face scepticism. They were simply not believed when they were crying out for help. The, the debilitating pain, infections, reduced mobility, autoimmune issues, difficulties with intimacy and psychological strain. They were simply not believed. It's no surprise that so many women sadly lost trust in our NHS and they are out protesting in Glasgow right now. Even when, we, when they were offered mesh removal surgery, many turned their backs on our NHS and went elsewhere, and understandably so. In practice, this meant using private healthcare providers in the UK and abroad. That's because until this year, there was no referral route from our NHS system to independent healthcare providers. And my only plea to the Cabinet Secretary is to speed through the next stage of getting women who have not had surgery through to assessment and removal surgery quickly uh, and not having a long wait. Until only recently, they have had to arrange everything themselves. Some would use up their family savings, borrow money or crowdsource for funds. Anything to stop the agony. Since this summer, we're at last making headway. In July, the Scottish Government agreed to meet the cost of the private treatment to remove transvaginal mesh. Costs will cover the procedure and travel expenses, somewhere between 16 and £23,000. The Scottish Government is now in the process of procuring the services of private providers to remove mesh from women who want it removed. They will have choice to have surgery out with the NHS in Scotland and will be funded by the Home Health Board, though I do hope women do take up the opportunity uh, to take it here uh, in Glasgow. Turning to today's legislation, the Transvaginal Mesh Removal Cost Reimbursement Bill, we strongly support this bill and I think we are all in agreement. Legislation, though, can have unintended consequences. That's why we spend so much time here and in committee on the details. If I may, I'd like to highlight a few points for clarification. As it stands, the bill only covers women currently residing in Scotland, not those who are now living in another country. That said, I am reassured that the Cabinet Secretary has just said he agrees that it is too narrow a requirement and that upon a second reading of the bill, he will consider an appropriate amendment at stage two. As this is a compensation bill, we need to ensure that fair and proper claims are reimbursed. We need to avoid unintentional rendering of a claim ineligible uh, because of reimbursement. Yes. Cabinet Secretary. Can I appreciate uh, Dr. Gohani for, for giving way? I just wanted to put on record just a clarification. Um, he referenced uh, an, an amount uh, per uh, surgery. It's just to confirm, although we have amounts, he's right in the financial memorandum, just to absolutely confirm in case there are, and I'm sure there are women listening, uh, if this bill is hopefully passed, there will not be a cap uh, on any application uh, if they have reasonable costs uh, that, that, that are eligible for the scheme. There's not a 23,000 uh, cap. That, that figure is just there for the financial memorandum, just to, to make that clear. Santish Gulhani. Yeah, the Cabinet Secretary was very clear when he came to Health Committee that there was no cap and I did not intend it to sound as though there was a cap. As this is a compensation bill, we need to ensure that fair and proper claims are reimbursed. We need to avoid the unintentional rendering of a claim ineligible for reimbursement. That said, so many of our women have been trying to cope with the personal and financial consequences of undergoing expensive private medical treatment. We need to get down to business as quickly as possible so they can apply for compensation as soon after an act comes into force. There are some questions, however, including whether executors of deceased can make a claim. I understand the Cabinet Secretary does not consider it to be advantageous to the women affected for the compensation scheme to be specified in regulation, as said just now, preferring instead an administrative scheme, which is quicker to implement and easier to amend where appropriate. 
Given the urgency to move this bill into law, I support this position. I look forward to hearing from members across the chamber this afternoon, and it is my wish that we find common ground when we come to vote. Common ground for the second time this week. And I would like to make it absolutely clear the Scottish Conservatives support the principles of this bill, and we will work together to speed this through Parliament. Thank you. I now call on Carol Mockham. Thank you, Presiding Officer. And may I thank my fellow members of the Health, Social Care and Sports Committee, um, who are all here today, for their work on this bill over recent weeks. I welcome this opportunity to, be, to open the debate for Scottish Labour, as our party has been at the forefront of this issue for years, with particular recognition being afforded to the former member for Lothian, Neil Finlay's efforts to get justice for the women affected by MESH. He and other parties across the chamber recognised early that here was an unspeakable injust injustice and we simply could not let it pass. Before I begin my comments on the bill, may I share in the recognition for the women who have campaigned relentlessly to keep this issue on the agenda here in Scotland. Efforts which have increased awareness of this serious problem, not only here, but across the UK. It is their campaigning which has meant, unlike so many others who never receive the compensation they deserve, women are close to justice on this issue. It is a brilliant story of courage and tenacity and one Scotland should be proud of. But only by saying we got it wrong in the first place and rectifying those mistakes can we truly embrace that pride. And certainly only after those who have been out of pocket have the record set straight. Every member of this parliament should take time to recognise the efforts of those women and reflect on the steps that were taken to get us here. Not least so we do not make the same mistakes again. We can never celebrate enough serious democratic engagement by those at the sharp end in our society. And I encourage other groups who feel they have been treated unjustly to come forward. This is your parliament and it is our duty to help you. And I just want to thank the women again, as many have, who um, forced us to listen to them. Thank you for coming forward. Thank you for making us listen. And thank you for sharing your stories. I know that must have been difficult. The Health and Social Care and Sports Committee is recommending that the general principles of the bill is supported, and my party shares that recommendation. As a member of the committee, I have been impressed with the detail and care that has been taken over the bill, and I think we can all agree that the general principles are both moral and just. A quick timetable to get this over the line is necessary, as the women affected by MESH have suffered more than enough, and I will be looking for guarantees, as you have, surrounding that as we proceed. But it is our duty now to make certain the bill delivers on its pro promises of fairness. Through the financial implications, though the financial implications may seem relatively small, for those it has helped, it is worth an unimaginable amount. It equates to recognition of their fight and the fact that they were right all along. During our session on the committee, I was struck by the lengths many women have gone to in order to get their mesh removed, and we've heard some of it. And we know from a good number that included travelling across the world. And we heard in committee stories of women travelling across the world, having to live in hotel rooms um, before their operation, then again after their, their surgery, because they required to stay on for treatment. And I think we can all imagine just how much we would all wish to be home um, and be with our loved ones while we were recovering. So people do not... People did not commit to such steps lightly, and as a result, we cannot approach this issue lightly. This is not to say there are not concerns which need to be addressed in the bill. Great, greater clarity, and we have had some recognition, is needed in terms of making it plain who will qualify for re mesh reimbursement and who will not. Throughout this process, I have been contacted by women who find the proposals difficult to understand, um, or imprecise, and that is something we can adjust to ensure no one misses out, and it has been addressed uh, both by the convener and by the uh, Cabinet Secretary. Just a bit of peace of mind can go a long way, and I'm gl glad we're addressing many of these worries during the committee hearings and here in the debate. Equally, there are some hidden complexities that many people observing this debate from afar may not have considered. 
but we have been considering in the Chamber. There is a strong case for individuals who have their original mesh surgery undertaken by NHS Scotland, but who were not ordinary residents in Scotland at the time of their surgery um, removal. I believe these should also be eligible for reimbursement. And I would hope that the Minister will again reassure us on this um, and that future, uh, uh, future uh, information on the bill will include this. The last thing anyone wants is to, for us to end up with another situation where these women feel ignored by the system or indeed shortchanged. I and others have made this point very clearly to the Cabinet Secretary in, in, in committee, and I'm assured that this will not be the case. Uh, but the government can, be equally, uh, can equally be assured that any deviation from these expectations will not be accepted by Scottish Labour or the women involved. The Cabinet Secretary has been quite rightly committed to being flexible in determining what costs will be reimbursed under the terms of the Bill, but the Committee has argued much greater detail is required for it to gain cross-party support, perhaps at later stages. But we have been reassured today that the, the Cabinet Secretary uh, is accepting the points that have been made by the members, and I trust that that will be realised. In closing, Scottish Labour will support this Bill at Stage 1. And if the reasonable expectations of the women affected are not sufficiently met, we will seek amendments to ensure the principles laid out today are delivered before the bill passes. Can I again thank everyone for the hard work, eh, everyone who has been invo involved in the bill, and I look forward to the next stages. I look ahead to some serious life-changing legislation that we can all be proud of. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Thank you. I now call on Alex Cole-Hamilton. Thank you very much, uh, Presiding Officer. It gives me great pleasure to rise for the Liberal Democrats in support of the general principles of this bill at stage one. Um, I, before I do so, uh, Presiding Officer, may I say that in my short career as an MSP, I cannot really remember another issue which I think captures the universal support, concern and horror of this chamber as this particular issue when it comes to domestic health scandals. Can I also take a moment to recognise the valiant work of people like Jackson Carlaw, Alex Neil, and Neil Finlay in bringing this to our attention and introducing us to some of the survivors of the MESH scandal. And nobody can forget who met them when they came to Parliament, the abject pain but profound dignity with which they conducted themselves. Um, I welcome this bill to Parliament. It has the potential to provide some further closure to women at the heart of this who have already taken the step to have MESH removed privately. And I would like to uh, take a moment to remember why we're here in the first place and why this is so necessary. Four years ago, I was contacted by a constituent of mine who gave me permission to share her story. In 2010, after suffering very mild issues with incontinence, Cathy was referred by her physiotherapist to a consultant who suggested that she should undergo a marvellous new procedure. Somewhat bewildered, she was asked to sign a consent form then and there. She said, and I think this is very characteristic of many women's stories, that it felt like she was entering some kind of clinical trial, although it was never spelled out to her quite like that. In fact, nothing was properly spelled out to her. Despite being booked in for the most invasive uh, transoburator tension-free vaginal implant, which is secured via spikes through the obturator muscle, she received very little information other than the procedure would cure her of her incontinence. When Cathy woke after surgery, she could not move. The nerve damage that she had sustained to her obturator muscles radiated pain through her abdomen, legs and back. Her condition was so bad that when she was discharged, she would not allow her son to drive at more than 30 miles an hour along the bypass. She tried to call the hospital for three days after being discharged and throughout the following week, but never received a call back from nursing staff or doctors. When Cathy visited her doctor, she was told that the pain might be related to the fact that she'd stopped smoking at the time of her operation and that she should try cutting out fat out of her diet as a means of helping. But at no point did any medical professional suggest that there may be a physical problem with the mesh implant. All told, Cathy went a full five years of trying to cope with abject pain before the cause was identified as the mesh implant itself. A routine checkup uh, with her gynaecologist revealed that the tape was in too tight on the right hand side and as such was constantly tearing, tearing at her obturator muscle. 
On seeking the advice of her surgeon, she received the devastating news that because her tissue had grown around the implant, it could not be removed without further significant nerve damage. Had someone taken her call at the hospital in the days after her operation, perhaps a reversal or a correction could have been performed then and there. So imagine her horror at receiving that news. And also consider that she, like several others, had been told at the time of surgery that mesh plastic would simply melt away over time. Once the cause of Cathy's pain was identified as the physical obstruction inside her, she was heavily medicated with gabapentin. And that drug had such a soporific effect on her, on her daily life, it forced her to retire from the job that she loved long, long before she had planned to. Cathy's implant has had a significant impact Impact on her mobility, her intimacy with her partner and her mental health. The mesh implant has devastated her quality of life and she is left with the Hobson's choice of making do or having it removed at potentially far greater nerve damage and resultant pain. She's far from alone in feeling like that and we have heard so many times countless other cases like it. I'm saddened it has taken us so long to get just to this point, to reimburse those people who have taken the step to have that harmful mesh removed privately. But even this bill will not give my constituent back that quality of life, that period of life that she has lost to her. I don't want to downplay the importance of this bill. It is important. We will support it. Financial reimbursement is essential part of regaining the trust of so many victims of this scandal and recognising the harm. And I think Carol Mocken was absolutely right that this bill sends a very important signal to those MESH survivors that we see you and we hear you and we recognise what has been done to you. The uncertainty surrounding who might be eligible for reimbursement as a result of this bill um, is a cause of concern. I think that's been recognised. And we are also concerned that it might actually only impact on a, a very limited number of people. We will work to help improve it as we transit through Parliament. Um, and I, I did want to explore, and perhaps this is a meeting I'll have offline with the Cabinet Secretary, if he's so willing, to see whether the reimbursement could be extended to survivors of hernia mesh removal as well, who've paid for that privately, because I've had a number of cases that I've raised, certainly with his predecessors, about people in equally debilitating pain as a result of her hernia mesh implants. At present, it was not within the scope of this bill. I don't imagine that's a huge number of people, but certainly the issues are much, the, much the same. Um, I, I recognise I'm running out of time, presiding officer. We have to offer more than warm words in this chamber, and until now, that's all we've been really able to do. Um, I, I think it's fair to say that we have been talking about this for years. Dr. Veronikis has been on the table for years. We, we've known about him for years, but it is only recently that these procedures have started to take place. I think it's a shame that we've only managed to do 33. I recognise the limitations that we face, however. Um, I hope that we'll be able to increase the rate at which we help people uh, far faster. I'll finish by saying this, presiding officer, if I may, to the survivors of the scandal, I say this. What you have been through is an outrage. No one should have to suffer so much physical or emotional pain because of a procedure that they were reassured would increase quality of life. You deserve so much more, and I am so sorry that you've been successively let down by the governments who were supposed to protect you. This is one of the worst medical scandals in the history of this country. We must offer more, and we must do so urgently. Thank you. Thank you. We now move to the open debate, and I call Stuart McMillan to be followed by Craig Hoy. Uh, thank you very much, Playing Officer. At the outset, I do welcome this bill and I pay tribute to everyone who has campaigned on this issue, but most importantly, the women who have campaigned for justice. I want to thank the Scottish Government for listening and also for acting. I also want to congratulate the members of the Health, Social Care and Sport Committee for their excellent Stage 1 report. They've captured the bill well and the recommendations are very much welcome. I've dealt with three constituents who have had mesh complications. Every one of these ladies has had their lives adversely affected in many ways. I've got a, I've had a great deal of correspondence with the Scottish Government on behalf of one lady in particular. She's called Michelle, and I have permission to highlight her today. This bill offers a great deal of hope for Michelle and many other women. The physical pain and mental challenges that these women are living with daily cannot be imagined. Added to that is the loss of trust in our NHS services, as referenced throughout the report. And it's no wonder that many women look beyond our NHS to try and reclaim some of their old lives back. Not one of my constituents 
if mesh problems believe, they will get their old lives back fully. But a life of less pain and progress towards reclaiming their lives will be a positive outcome for some. This is where the first sentence in the recommendation that paragraph 92 is so important. And I quote, the committee supports the principles of fairness, equity and parity, which, in its view, underpin the bill. If the bill's aims are that, and they clearly are, then the discussion about how women have or will fund mesh removal treatments is redundant, in my opinion. Not every person has tens of thousands of pounds in a savings bank, uh, therefore have to raise finance somehow. For some, it will be borrowing from friends or family. For others, it will be bank loan or maxing out a credit card. For others, it will be selling items or organising fundraising nights, bring in extra resources. Another example will be to use a crowdfunding platform. I know that Michelle had many of these examples, but she was struggling to deal with the pain and wanted to reclaim some of her life. At some point in time, just about every MSP as a candidate to get elected to this parliament will have undertaken a crowdfunder. Why can we do that? But there appears to be a concern that women in pain cannot. It makes absolutely no sense to me. I therefore welcome the recommendation of paragraph 69, but also note the comments attributed to the Cabinet Secretary in paragraph 68. It is clear that there are many unknowns regarding the bill, i.e. how many women will be eligible for the scheme, how many women will pursue the mesh removal treatment, and the actual cost for each woman and the travelling companion. This is where it is extremely challenging for the Cabinet Secretary and the Scottish Government to produce a financial memorandum with absolute financial clarity. This is where the Stage 1 report asking for a reassessment of estimates is perfectly reasonable. The paragraph 87 in the report makes the recommendation about and I quote, an appropriate level of scrutiny to take place with regards to future subordinate legislation about the proposed scheme. As a convener of the Delegated Powers and Law Reform Committee, I can see how using the affirmative procedure would be beneficial in, in this instance, but also accept, as the committee itself did in paragraph 10, and I quote, the committee has been keen to ensure an appropriate balance between enabling effective scrutiny of the bill while not unduly delaying reimbursement to those affected. This is where I do note the, the comments from the Cabinet Secretary today, and also in his reply to the committee, uh, that the regulations, if there, if there were regulations, could actually be more time consuming, uh, and thus, therefore, the administrative scheme it could actually be a lot quicker. The final point I want to address is the self titled in between us, as suggested in paragraph 33 in the report. I also to note that and welcome the paragraph 35 in the report highlighting, and I quote the Cabinet Secretary's intention, that anyone who made their own arrangements for treatment outside of the NHS on or before the announcement on the 12th of July 2021 will be able to apply for reimbursement, regardless of whether or not that treatment has already been carried out. However, the committee recommendations in paragraphs 39, 40 and 41 are really important, particularly the call in paragraph 40 asking the Scottish Government to, and I quote, demonstrate appropriate flexibility in the definition of making an arrangement for mesh removal surgery. The clarity surrounding the making an arrangement will, I hope, provide absolute clarity to Michelle and other women. I know that dialogue and uh, communication took place prior to the 12th of July between Michelle and, uh, and uh, the professor that she had an operation with, but the agreement was signed. Uh, so the agreement and also the operation actually were signed after the 12th of July. I welcome the statement from the Cabinet Secretary to provide that greater clarity regarding the post 12th of July situation, also when the procurement exercise, which was announced also on the 12th, and also the dates when the contracts are established in addition to the pathways open to referrals. During also my considerations in this bill are solely for Michelle and other constituents I've spoken to. Nothing, nothing will be able to change the experiences they have suffered and had to endure, but with the greater clarity and the passing of this bill, I would hope they can actually have a future that is more positive. We, as a parliament, owe them that. Thank you. Thank you. I call Craig Hoy to be followed by David Torrance. Uh, thank you, presiding officer. As a new member, I am pleased to be able to speak in this debate uh, about what is a short uh, but landmark piece of legislation. This is legislation which has taken too long to come. But it is nonetheless legislation that I hope that might still stand out as an example of what this Parliament can achieve when we work with and on behalf of our constituents. 
and I pay tribute to the women who have got us to this point and also to colleagues in this chamber, uh, such as Jackson Carlaw and previously Alex Neil and also Neil Findlay, who became their voice in this Parliament. As we have heard, this bill establishes a scheme to reimburse people who have made their own arrangements to have transvaginal mesh removed. From the outset, let us recognise that these were women who faced scepticism when complaining about adverse effects, women who felt they were not believed, women who experienced distress and who often experienced very long periods of time before remedial surgical intervention could take place. Many elected representatives, whether MSPs, MPs or councillors, have been contacted by constituents living with the terrible consequences of transvaginal mesh. Mesh that was used to treat problems often linked with childbirth, including stress, urinary incontinence and pelvic organ prolapse. Shockingly, the worries over mesh were all too often dismissed by some in the medical profession as women's problems. This was lax, this was negligent, this was insensitive and this was wrong. And yet, it continued in some cases for nearly or over 20 years. And let us be in no doubt that the action of some in the medical profession exposed women to avoidable harms for too long. And in July 2020, in her review into the avoidable harm caused by MESH, uh, Baroness Cumberledge, in her inquiry, looked into the pain and suffering that women, often very young women, were forced to endure. As we have heard today, this included severe and chronic pain, recurrent infections, mobility issues and incontinence. It highlighted complications including prolapse, bowel problems, sexual difficulties, fatigue, depression, PTSD, suicidal feelings and sometimes death. Tragically, women also reported that mesh complications led to relationship failing and family breakdown. It resulted in a loss of employment, families losing their homes and it led to financial hardship. All life-changing, presiding officer, but all avoidable. And I thank the Minister for his thoughtful and open-minded uh, response uh, today at Stage 1 and welcome uh, his willingness to look at any uh, enhancements or amendments to this Bill at Stage 2. Today I want to take this opportunity to commend the many women in the support groups that they established around the world. They were tireless, they were brave, committed campaigners who spent years raising the alarm about the consequences of mesh implants. These women didn't give up, they didn't go away even when, deep down, they felt shut out and ignored. But their commitment eventually led to a breakthrough in this Parliament, and the petition presented to the Parliament by Elaine Holmes and Olive McElroy on behalf of the Hear Our Voice campaign means that today we are considering this bill at Stage 1. The petition called for suspension in the use of transvaginal mesh and a full evaluation of safety concerns. It also made the case for the introduction of fully informed consent throughout Scotland and it called for the improved reporting of complications after surgery and a national register of all procedures linked to international registers. In 2017, the Scottish Transvaginal Mesh Implants Independent Review recommended stopping uh, the process altogether, and since then, the uh, POP uh, Transvaginal uh, Mesh Surgery has been restricted to research trials only. But let us not look the uh, tragic and the justifiable loss of trust that many women felt, and some continue to feel, towards some in the medical profession and our NHS. They felt isolated, they saw their concerns dismissed, and many then sought uh, removal surgery, out with and often well beyond the boundaries of the NHS. They went to private providers at home and abroad, and they secured funding through a range of means. Presiding officer, it's worth noting that there was no available referral route to, ind to independent providers, and that today the Scottish Government acknowledges this and also recognises the lack of trust and the reasons behind it. Uh, the legislation rightly concedes that the circumstances are exceptional and that reimbursement for both the cost of surgery and associated travel and other, and other costs is fully justified. But the Bill's consultation process also raised several concerns about the, elig the eligibility of who can apply for the scheme, and many of those have been touched on already today. As Stuart Macmillan noted, there is a question mark surrounding some of the sources of funding used for private treatment. For example, whether women should be eligible for reimbursement if they received money via uh, crowdfunding. While the Scottish Conservatives strongly support the bill, we do believe that further, further clarity is needed on the issue of the eligibility criteria. And I also welcome 
uh, Gillian Martin's call today that once this bill is passed uh, for uh, wide um, promotion uh, of the reimbursement scheme. We should, however, never lose sight of the fact that, we're de that we are dealing today with women who were badly let down, women who face devastating, life-changing consequences as a result. And we have a responsibility to ensure that they receive the best and the most appropriate treatment available. We have a duty to help them rebuild their lives. Presiding officer, I look forward to the concerns raised at stage one being addressed as this bill makes its way through this parliament, because for mesh sufferers, this legis legislation cannot come a moment too soon. And now is the time to fully deliver the care, the, ca the compassion, the compensation, and hopefully the closure that the victims of transvaginal mesh so rightly deserve. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Thank you. I call David Torrance to be followed by Katie Clark. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I was a member of a public petitions committee back in 2014 when the issue of propylene mesh medical devices was brought to a committee's attention by Scottish mesh survivors. To this day, I vividly recall the passion and the strength of feeling of all women that gave their time to attend our meetings, to give evidence and recount their stories and personal experiences. It is thanks to the tenacity and the bravery of these women that we are here today discussing the introduction of transvaginal mesh removal cost reimbursement Scotland Bill and the significant number of steps that the Scottish Government has taken to offer assistance and better help women harmed by vaginal mesh and complications arising from it. As a current member of the Health and Social Care Support Committee, I am delighted to see a bill introduced which aims to give the powers to Scottish Ministers to reimburse persons who have entered into arrangements privately to have paid to have the transvaginal mesh removed from their body, in relation to the cost of removal surgery and also reasonable connected expenses. Before it was halted in 2018 by NHS Scotland, the use of polypropylene mesh medical implants to treat pelvic organic prolapse and stress, stress urinary incontinence left many women with life-changing complications and facing multiple operations to remove it from inside their bodies. Recognition by his government of the suffering and considerable harm caused as a result of complications arising from the use of transvaginal mess and its determination to do everything within its powers to help was affected is hugely encouraging. We have already taken a decisive action on mesh and now Scotland is the first UK country to reimburse people for private treatment previously sought. Before coming here today, I spoke with a constituent who was dealing with a trauma caused by a mesh implant for over five years. She was fitted with implants following a front and back prolapse in November 2016. By February of 2017, the mesh had come loose, resulting in her uterus hanging outside her body, starting a chain of visits back and forth to gynaecologists in an attempt to find someone to help. Everyone recognised the impossible situation she was in, but no one could offer a solution. In her words, her life effectively ended in 2017. Living with extensive daily bleeding, double incontinence, a constant exhaustion and a sizable uterine tissue bulging outside her body meant she had to give up work and lost contact with family and friends. She went from being an outgoing sociable woman to someone who physically couldn't leave the house. I don't think any of us can truly appreciate the mental strain that this must have caused. After many years of solitude and a bid to live a normal life by attending a family function, she reports fasting for an entire day and night beforehand in hope that she might be able to enjoy the occasion. Despite this, she lasted only one hour before having to call family and friends to assist her to leave discreetly following an incident of bowel incontinence. Needless to say, she did not attend any more events. She has recently found a surgeon who has offered some hope and is now on the first steps of a journey which will hopefully see her quality of life begin to improve. It is clear to see why some women felt let down by the NHS and felt the need to seek private arrangements to have transvaginal mesh removed. The daily stress caused by imaginable pain, accompanied by difficulties posed by incontinence issues, have many, led many to pay in the region of £20,000 to travel to private clinics to pay for treatment. I highlight our story today because it is easy to get lost in numbers. We have to look past the data and the statistics and the cost to see real people beneath. To the personal experiences of mothers, daughters, sisters and families all across the country whose lives have been negatively affected by life-changing complications and pain, many of whom have ended up in wheelchairs, have endured multiple organ trauma or extensive nerve damage. All have a story to tell, many of them harrowing, but it is our duty to listen. Earlier this year we saw a case record review begin, which is looking into concerns raised by patients about their medical records. 
as we move forward the continuing work of the review for women who have raised their concerns about whether their case records accurately reflect the treatment they have received, specifically in relation to full and partial removal of mesh, will be a vital tool, ensuring that affected women's voices are heard by giving women an opportunity to set out their concerns, have their records reviewed by clinicians to allow for discussion, explanation and mutual understanding. I truly hope that these women get the answers they need about their situation. In conclusion, President Officer, I am delighted to see the introduction of this bill and fully support the recommendations in the report, which I hope the Government takes on board. In particular, the recommendations that any scheme must include a flexible approach to reimbursement that takes account of individual circumstances. These women already have been through so much, and I believe the time is long overdue for all women who need their mesh removed to have it done and to compensate affected women for the cost of private mesh removal surgery. I pay tribute to hundreds of women who came together and have campaigned tirelessly to highlight the suffering caused by effects of polypropylene mesh implant surgery. And I look forward to the progress of this bill and to working alongside all colleagues to ensure that no other woman will have to endure the dreadful experience that mesh survivors have had to endure. Thank you. I call Katie Clark to be followed by Evelyn Tweed. Thank you, Presiding Officer, and it's a pleasure to speak in this debate and welcome this bill. And I congratulate all those who have campaigned for this legislation over such a long time. And I also welcome all the contributions that have been made so powerfully um, here today. Like others, I have met with um, MESH survivors and I have found even hearing about some of the experiences of the women directly affected harrowing. The details of the massive life-changing implications which they've often said have ruined their lives and the considerable pain which women have endured as a result of the use of mesh are difficult to forget and therefore this will, bill is clearly very welcome. I hope it will help um, the women who were involved, um, who were affected and in particular um, I hope it will be welcomed by the Scottish Mess Survivors Campaign. And I hope that all the women who are affected by vaginal mess removal will receive the treatment and the appropriate expenses in the way that I believe MSPs wish them to do. But there are, of course, many other mesh survivors who are not covered by this legislation, and we also mustn't forget them today. Another petition has been lodged in this parliament, which refers to some of the other women and also men who have been affected by the use of other mesh procedures, such as hernia mesh, rectal mesh, and mesh used in hysterectomies. I, I suspect others also, have been contacted by constituents who have been adversely affected by these types of procedures and are asking for action similar to that proposed in this bill today. I hope um, that the government will listen um, to what they're saying and to the review that they're asking for for all these forms of procedures also. And I hope um, that the government will adopt a similar approach um, to those individuals as they have um, to the women affected um, by vaginal mesh that we're discussing today. This issue, um, of course, was first raised in this parliament in 2013 and has been regularly raised um, since that time. And I think the fact that it's taken so long to get this to the point where we have a bill in front of us today is important. We know that the Independent Medicines and Medical Devices Review, which was led by Baroness Cumberledge, looked at these issues. And indeed, many of the steps that the Scottish Government is putting into effect today are based on the recommendations of that review report. One of the issues that that um, report looked at was the way that women um, are treated when they raise health concerns. Um, and we've already heard um, about how women weren't believed and how women weren't listened to. That obviously is not just an issue in relation um, to this form of mess procedure, but is something that many of us have been aware of and indeed have experienced over many, many years. And I think there are many lessons that we all have to learn and government has to learn um, from the way um, that the vaginal mesh has been treated um, that are relevant to many of the other situations that women are in um, in the health service. 
Another recommendation from the review report was that manufacturers should be involved in contributing to the cost of redress, but it does not look like the Scottish Government is getting any money um, from manufacturers. Um, there are a number of manufacturers. Ethicon is one of those um, manufacturers and is a subsidiary of Johnson and & Johnson. And if I use um, that company as an example, we know that they are losing court cases. At one time, Ethicon faced more than 40,000 transvaginal mess lawsuits, which obviously were based on their negligence. Um, both in relation to transvaginal mesh devices, but also bladder sling complications. Um, and a number of those um, lawsuits have um, been successful. And ac according to their 2020 annual report, there were still um, 14,900 pelvic mesh lawsuits outstanding. They have agreed to pay £117 million in 41 states in the United States of America. And um, the District of Columbia um, agreed to settle claims um, in relation to deceptive marketing of pelvic mesh products in October um, 2019. This bill is, of course, in its initial stages. Um, I hope very much during the course of this bill we will look at all of the issues that are being raised today, but we will also look at the responsibility that the manufacturers have in this process and how we make sure that women that were affected by these procedures get justice from government, but also get justice from some of, of the others that have been negligent and have failed um, to respect um, and provide adequate services for women um, who are facing um, difficult situations. Um, I hope that during the course of this bill that we'll be able to explore these issues and strengthen the legislation. Thank you. I call Evelyn Tweed to be followed by Gillian Mackay. Officer. As a member of the Health, Social Care and Sport Committee, I am pleased to take part in this debate. I welcome the cross-party support that I have heard today for the general principles of this bill. I thank the women who have come forward to share their experiences. This could not have been easy. Without their assistance, we would not have been able to uncover the serious damage transvaginal mesh surgery has caused, and not just physically, but emotionally, mentally and financially. As other members in this chamber have expressed, the damage and pain endured by women as a result of mesh implants cannot be understated. Lives have been turned upside down, mental health destroyed, finances stretched to the brink, all whilst putting up with daily and excruciating pain. For the women at the centre of this crisis, following medical advice seemed the obvious thing to do. We would all have done the same. We accept the advice of our medical professionals who are acting on the best information available to them. Living with issues such as stress, urinary incontinence and pelvic or organ prolapse, they trusted the medical guidance to have mesh, also known as transvaginal tape, implanted into their bodies. We know this mesh can cause severe pain in the lower abdomen, sometimes leaving women unable to walk. We must accept that occasionally our health service professionals will get things wrong. That is the inevitable, and so it was absolutely right to permanently halt the use of TVT and apologise to the women affected. And when something goes wrong, the most important thing is to put it right, with due diligence and care, and as fast as reasonably possible. Over the last few months, I have heard heartbreaking testimonies detailing not just the physical pain, but significant mental and emotional trauma as well. For some, this pain has been so severe that they have been forced to find, fund private health care through remortgages, bank loans, credit cards or borrowing from family and friends or crowdfunding. For these women, many who are still in substantial debt, time is of the essence. There can be no further delay. I, like others in this parliament, have listened to these women, but more importantly, the Cabinet Secretary and the Scottish Government have listened. 
I am sure that every member in the Parliament will support this bill and its fast tracking so that these women do not have to wait any longer as they have waited long enough. The Government has confirmed that women who arranged mesh approval surgery will be eligible to apply for reimbursement, and it does not matter if the surgery was successful or not. I completely understand for the women who have been through such traumatic experiences that compensation for corrective surgery might not be enough. We must do more to put right these wrongs and build back the trust. To ensure patients receive treatment that they have confidence in a procurement process is underway, to allow appropriately qualified surgeons outside the NHS to perform removal for patients in Scotland. That said, this is clearly an exceptional situation. Our brilliant and dedicated staff in the NHS have learnt from these past mistakes. The complex pelvic mesh removal service is now established in NHS Scotland to allow everyone affected to get the treatment and the care that they need. I am also pleased to see that the Health and Social Care Alliance will undertake a patient focus group to understand patients' views on how the scheme of reimbursement might work in practice. The feedback from this will play an important role in shaping the scheme. I welcome the Scottish Government's response to the Committee's Stage 1 report, which accepts the bulk of the recommendations put forward, as the Cabinet Secretary has outlined today, and also note the urgency in which the Government wants to act. I note the Government's intention under the Bill to take a proportionate and flexible approach to the provision of evidence of costs incurred, and this will provide much reassurance to the women involved. I also note some points will be considered in the draft scheme and look forward to seeing this. Sad, sadly, transvaginal mesh was used regularly in Scotland before 2014. It was also used in the rest of the UK and across the world. Scotland is the first UK country to reimburse people for private treatment, and I am pleased that the Scottish Government is once again leading the way and taking decisive action to make people's lives better. Thank you to my colleagues in committee and across the chamber for welcoming this bill to Parliament. Thank you. Thank you. And I call Gillian Mackay to be followed by Cokai Stewart. Uh, six minutes, Ms Mackay. Thank you, Presiding Officer. As a member of the Health, Social Care and Sport Committee, I am very pleased to be speaking in this debate and in support of the Bill at Stage 1. I wanted to start by thanking the women who came to give evidence at committee and all those who have campaigned tirelessly for justice. I cannot imagine the impact that this has had on your lives and those of your families, and I am in awe of your continued determination. I also want to thank those MSPs and former MSPs who supported the women last session, including those affectionately known by MESH survivors as the MESH Kateers, Alex Neil, Neil Finlay and Jackson Carlaw. I am keen, as I am sure many of my colleagues across the Chamber are, that we get a reimbursement system that is flexible enough to ensure that no one is unfairly penalised. Many of the women who paid for their own MESH removal did not anticipate being reimbursed. For many, this will mean that they no longer have food receipts or proof of taxi journeys, for example. The committee also raised concerns about the potential restrictiveness of both the proposed cut-off date of the scheme and the residency requirements, and I am pleased to hear the commitment of the Cabinet Secretary on the residency element. We heard at committee that for some of those going to America for surgery, COVID has delayed these trips, and I hope that we have a contingency in place to ensure that no one falls through the gap between the cut-off date for the reimbursement scheme and the start date of the new private surgery contracts a point I thought was well made at committee by Jackie Bailey. For some of the so-called in-betweeners, for medical reasons, they may not be able to wait for the new contracts to be in place if MESH was compromising organs or causing unbearable pain. If this legislation is to achieve its intended purpose, we must avoid women falling through the cracks. As the committee report notes, the bill documentation does not address the question of whether cases where private removal surgery has not been fully or partially successful will be reimbursed. I believe that no survivors should be penalised for not having had a successful surgery. 
For some women, full mesh removal will not have been possible. Emma Harper made the excellent point at committee that it will be difficult to measure success. Is it 40% mesh removal, 60% or 90%? Some may have had private exploratory surgery to be told that their mesh could not be removed, and I believe they should still have their costs reimbursed. We must ensure women are not being excluded from the scheme due to circumstances out with their control. We also need to take account of the fact that some women will not have been able to afford the cost of private removal surgery and will have not expected to be reimbursed, so did not pursue private treatment. As the committee report notes, those women may have experienced the same breakdown in trust between them and the NHS and may understandably be upset that they have been further disadvantaged than by their inability to pay up front. We must ensure that trust is rebuilt between them and the health services. Some women will have borrowed money from family and friends to pay for their surgery. I strongly feel that they should not be excluded from any reimbursement scheme. Some women had to leave employment due to the debilitating effects of mesh impl implantation and some of their partners will have become full-time carers. They may not have been able to secure a loan and sh so should not be penalised for having to turn to family and friends for help. I appreciate that there may be difficulty in securing evidence for informal donations as opposed to a bank loan, and I would welcome any comments from the Minister on how those issues could be worked through. In committee, I raised the importance of support, supporting MESH survivors' mental health and asked whether consideration has been given to reimbursing private medical costs related to mental health treatment. Some MESH survivors may have lost confidence in the Scottish NHS as a whole and they may want to seek private treatment for what has been, for many of them, a traumatising event. If this bill is about righting a wrong, then I do think we need to consider other forms of treatment and support the women affected to seek, have had to seek as a result of their MESH surgery. I also have concerns about the residency requirement. I believe that women who received their original mesh surgery when they were resident in Scotland should qualify for reimbursement under the scheme. Some women may have moved away from Scotland after their original surgery due to a breakdown in trust between them and NHS Scotland, and I do not believe they should be penalised for this. As the committee report notes, greater clarity is needed around this if the bill is to adhere to the principles of fairness and equity. I would like to close by saying that I look forward to working with members across the Chamber as this bill progresses. We have all heard the devastating impact the MESH Im implantation has had on many of the women affected. It is vital that the bill establishes a comprehensive, fair scheme which does not result in MESH survivors falling through the cracks. And we owe them that, at least. Thank you, Ms Mackay. And I call Co-Cab Stewart to be followed by Pam Gosal. Again, six minutes, Ms Stewart. Um, thank you, Presiding Officer. Um, I'd like to start by thanking the Cabinet Secretary and the members of the Health, Care and Sport Committee for their work in bringing this bill to the Chamber. More than anyone, though, um, I'd like to take a moment myself as well to thank the women who have campaigned so tirelessly on this issue. It is no exaggeration to say that the bravery shown by the women involved in this debate has been inspiring. Prior to my election, I followed this debate uh, very closely, whether at Westminster or Holyrood, Holyrood, and listened with concern, disbelief and anger at the accounts of those women who have suffered and continue to suffer as a result of transvaginal uh, mesh implants. I read testimonies from the women who informed Baroness Cumberledge's inquiry and found their accounts striking, highlighting wider issues in how patients are communicated with. No one is listening. The patient's voice is dismissed. I was never told the failure of informed consent. It is therefore important today to acknowledge the invaluable work of advocacy groups such as the Scottish Mesh Survivors Group and Alliance Scotland for their role in progressing this issue. The reports published by Alliance Scotland in 2019 and 2021 provided a platform for MESH survivors to collate their lived experiences and present their irrefutable findings. It is safe to say that their voice is finally being heard loudly and clearly in this chamber. Indeed, listening to MESH survivors is central to today's bill. 
Presiding officer, it has taken too long to get here, but I'm pleased that the steps taken to reach this point have resulted in mesh surgeries in Scotland dropping from 2,267 in 2009 to the current day where no further vaginal mesh surgeries have taken place in Scotland since 2018. The Scottish Government now seek to continue their work into redressing the wrongs suffered and in turn rebuilding the trust that has understandably been lost. Thankfully, today's debate moves this conversation forward again and is now focusing on how best to expedite the satisfactory resolutions for those women still suffering the consequences of this treatment, whether they be physical, mental or financial. Costs in each case are substantial, estimated between 16,000 to 23,000, significant sum by anybody's standards, let alone for many of the women who could not afford this, but in desperation absorbed that heavy financial burden in the hope of alleviating the daily agony that they endured. The simple fact that the legislation proposed aims uh, to not only assist the women who still require corrective surgery, receive it in a manner that they are comfortable with, but also allows for reparations, is something that transcends political affiliation, and I welcome the cross-party support on this issue. I therefore welcome this bill at stage one and the Scottish Government's continued commitment to ensuring that every woman in need of corrective surgery due to transvaginal mesh receives it. It is performed by a surgeon they have full confidence in, whilst also removing the financial burden so many have been left with who merely sought to take control back over their lives. Thank you. to be contributing to this debate. It is important that the women who were forced to seek private arrangements to remove the transvaginal mesh are reimbursed for the cost occurred. And that the scheme moves forward as soon as possible. Presiding officer, I would like to thank those who stepped forward in an act of courage and provided evidence about the complications with the mesh and the later arrangements they made to have it removed. Such an act could not have been an easy thing to do, but their strength and convictions have led to this important issue being debated here today in Parliament. I am very grateful to follow on from some of the excellent heartfelt speeches we have heard today in the Chamber from all the parties. The bill before us today does far more than just reimburse women who have suffered from this procedure. It corrects a wrong particularly for those women whose painful side effects and complications were not taken seriously. Concerns about the severe and painful complications arising from the use of the mesh have been reported since the mid-2000s. Just today, a survivor told the STV News, it feels like you're getting sliced and I would sooner go through childbirth again with no gas and air and no drugs. The pain is chronic. Is there, it's there all the time and you can't switch it off. It exhausts me. Some days I don't get out of bed. I've got to use walking sticks and I have a chair. And when I get up, I'm off balance. While these words may make many of us uncomfortable, the simple matter is, these women went through years of pain with no support. We can't forget them. Presiding officer, I'm happy that the special service has been in operation, established a multidisciplinary team of skilled professionals, and I look forward to reading the service review next month. I fully support the bill and the objectives underpinning the bill, which seek to ensure fairness and consistency of the treatment for all individuals in relation to the mesh removal service in Scotland and the falling scheme for reimbursement. However, it is certain that there must be more clarity within the bill to ensure that its objectives are met, beginning with residency criteria and timescales. 
On residency, the, state, uh, the current state of bill excludes those who have their mesh fit fitted in Scotland and later. Had the mesh removed while re residing in another country? I welcome the Cabinet Secretary's comments today on agreeing to table an appropriate amendment at stage two on the residing criteria. As these people deserve to be reimbursed, at the end of the day, they suffered, they were ignored, and they had to take matters into their own hands. It is the Scottish Government's responsibility to ensure that these people are compensated. In relation to timescales, the Bill in its second stage must also address people who are currently awaiting or in the middle of organising treatment privately. It is our duty to ensure that we begin to build back the trust between these individuals and the NHS, not break it. Presiding officer, across the chamber today, there is broad support for this bill, and as there should be, but that does, doesn't mean we can't discuss any concerns about the detail of the scheme. Therefore, inclusion, I fully support the bill and its objectives. And I welcome the Cabinet Secretary's comments today on looking at adjusting the cut-off date and tabling the appropriate amendments at Stage 2 on the residency criteria. Presiding officer, it took a decade for these women to be recognised and believed. However, we, must wait, we mustn't sorry, wait years to deliver the support and pain relief these women are so desperately in need. Therefore, we look forward to working cross-party to ensure a timely and smoothly delivery. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Gosal. I now call on Siobhan Brown, who will be followed by Martin Whitfield uh, again six minutes. Ms. Brown. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I welcome this bill to Parliament today. I've been attempting to navigate through the absolute nightmare of living with mesh for 12 years. This is a heartbreaking testimony of Isabel from Presswick, a constituent of mine who's got in touch when there was nowhere else to turn after years of suffering because of the mesh implant. She's given me permission today to use, tell her story. 12 years ago, Isabel received the implant in the hope it would improve her quality of life after the birth of her second child. The mesh, which had been around for a number of years before that, was hailed as a revolutionary treatment for women suffering from stress, incontinence or a prolapse, issues which arise from having children. Isabel's surgery was to correct a prolapsed bladder. Fast forward to now, and Isabel has had to have six surgeries to correct the damage, to remove the mesh and a hysterectomy. But every day she continues to live with chronic pain in her legs, her buttocks, bladder complications, erosion of tissue, and sadly, the original problem, the bladder prolapse. The pain was so great she had to call time on her 30-year career in education. And it's not just Isabel. We've heard countless stories today of women who severe, with severe and constant pain in their abdomen, their stomach, their bladder, their limbs. We've heard stories about women in wheelchairs and sadly deaths. The women going through this living hell have had to fight every step of the way to get help. Through evidence sessions and inquiries sharing the most intimate details of their medical history and to be still in pain with nowhere to turn. Only five centimetres of mesh was ever removed from Isabel with the mesh centre in Glasgow discharging her saying that there was nothing more that they could do. Earlier this year, women were promised surgery in England and the US to correct the wrongs of the mesh implant caused. But we must do more. We must act quicker, as women say they feel like they've been forgotten about. The wait to see these specialists sometimes can be up to two years. Women are suffering day to day, and two years is an eternity. And we must be prepared to pay for the damage that this has caused. Day to day living is getting harder for Isabel. She's left no stone unturned in her pursuit of a better quality of life. Finally, Isabel has turned to me. It is important that I be the last of this chain. I need to find a solution for Isabel, and all, I'm all too acutely aware of what that solution is. It's money. For some women, the announcement gave them hope, something they, they felt they'd given up on a long time ago. But we need more than hope. We need more than promises. We need, need action. The Mesh Removal Bill seeks to reimburse women to, 
who have paid for the procedure themselves, including costs of travel, whether it be to Bristol or the US. The cost of the procedure could be between £16,000 to £23,000, which we've heard previously. And for many people like Isabel, that money just isn't there to pay for these costs up front. We must remove all barriers to this surgery that seeks to give some quality of life back. Isabel told me, because of the ongoing complications and chronic pain, the youngest daughter has never really met the real me. She describes that as the worst of all the side effects. We cannot turn back the clock, and we can, but we can correct this going forward. We need to streamline the pathways that ultimately will give Isabel her life back, a concrete, achievable timeline. Her daughter can't await, afford to wait another two years to meet the real Isabel. I'm grateful that the Scottish Government is helping women through this bill. However, today I ask that we go further, make referrals quicker, make decisions quicker, put contracts for the removal in place and putting funding in place across the board, not just for those who can afford it and pay up front. I welcome the Health Committee's recommendation to the bill for further detail from the Scottish Government on campaigns to publicise a complex mesh national surgical service, training for primary care staff on mesh complications and person-centred approaches for supporting individuals through treatment, including pre- and post-operative support. I'd also like to ask the Cabinet Secretary, in instances such as Isabel, if my constituent does not wish to have further surgery in Glasgow and wishes to choose her own consultant, such as Dr Veronica's, to carry out the procedure, would the Scottish Government consider supporting these women to bring peace of mind and a conclusion to their ordeal? It's only fitting that I end with Isabel's words. Many older MESH survivors have been through the system and have been discriminated against and ignored. Time is running out. I welcome the first stage of this bill as we move forward to rectify this situation. Thank you very much, uh, Ms Brown. Before calling the final um, speaker in the open debate, I just remind members that anybody that's contributed to the debate needs to be in the chamber for the closing speeches. And with that, I call the final speaker in the open debate, Martin Whitfield, for six minutes, Mr Whitfield. I'm very grateful, Deputy Presiding Officer. And I'd like to extend my thanks to the committee for their report on this. But I also want to put on record, of course, my admiration for those women that have fought with dignity and have fought with determination to get this chamber where it is today. And I know that this debate would not be taking place but for the bravery of the Scottish MESH survivors and indeed both their demand for this bill but also that phenomenally powerful willingness to share their personal stories. And can I congratulate Siobhan Brown um, and indeed her constituent Isabel on allowing her story to be shared because it's through those stories that we actually see the significant impact of those events that happened over a decade ago and carried on. That willingness to share is so important so that people who are unaware of the suffering can empathise and see what has happened. Let me say from the outset that we are fortunate to have a national health service that is free at the point of use. And throughout this pandemic, we have seen the very best of our NHS here in Scotland and its heroic workforce. However, we must hold our hands up and accept mistakes were made with many, indeed far too many women, being failed when their transvaginal mesh devices were inserted by NHS doctors. And as such, and to this day, many women are reluctant to return to those very same surgeons and have the device removed. I sympathise with them, I understand that, and it will take a long, long time for the trust to be rebuilt between the NHS and those women. And for this reason and many more, I'm supportive of the overall aims and principles of the, the bill. Women have gone through a traumatic experience since having their mesh fitted, and it is right that the Scottish Government covers the related costs that have been incurred in removing the device. And after all, it has taken us a long time to get to this point perhaps too long. So in the short time that's left, Pres Deputy Presiding Officer, if you'd allow me, I'd like to pose a few questions to the Cabinet Secretary and the Minister, not to raise any disagreement, but to seek advice. Today in Glasgow, MESH survivors felt the need to protest outside the new Victoria Hospital in Glasgow. And part of that protest is in respect of the length of time that's been indicated to them they may have to wait for initial assessments. And there is a talk of up to two years. There are 
members of the Mesh Survivors Group that are there today who have had their appointments cancelled with just a week's notice. These are the very women we are asking to seek again and to trust our NHS. And I know there are challenging problems. We are all aware of that. But I think for this particular group of women, so much more should be done to bring reassurance and confidence going forward. In the Cabinet Secretary's opening, he talked about the 33 women who have received their mesh removal operations now. Would it be possible to tell us how many women are still waiting for mesh removal? And finally, we have heard today from a number of speakers about the challenge that exists over the date that's being anticipated to go in this bill. And I wonder whether an indication, well, I welcome, obviously, very much so, the Cabinet Secretary's willingness to reconsider this, but I wonder whether comment could be made if that date couldn't be the date of commissioning the ongoing surgery. And that way we would know that all of the women survivors will be covered up until the point that there is an alternative, suitable and supported method to see a journey to the end of the problem that we are at. Can I welcome all of the speeches that I've heard today, particularly those that have shared the very, very powerful testimony of those individual women who have suffered from this. We should not have been in this place, but we are. And it is now for this chamber to show that there is a way out, but that has to be done swiftly so that trust in the NHS can be reassured. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. Thank you very much indeed, Mr Whitfield. We now move to closing speeches. I note that Gillian Mackay um, isn't present in the chamber and I would expect an, an explanation for that uh, in due course. But with that, I ask Paul Kane to wind up for around six minutes, Mr Kane. Uh, thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. And in closing for Scottish Labour, I wish to begin by reflecting the strong consensus I think we have heard in this debate today. Stage one of this bill marks a significant milestone in what has been a long, painful and difficult journey for so many. The Cabinet Secretary rightly opened by reflecting on those who have brought us to consideration of this bill today. And I too wish to pay tribute to the steadfast determination of Scottish Mesh survivors who have bravely told their stories and campaigned for this bill and other measures to support all those affected. Having heard myself some of the testimony in committee, I am struck by the bravery of women recounting the trauma they have experienced and lived with, not only to affect change for themselves, uh, but also to affect change for the many others who have had the same experiences. As we've heard, they have repeated these stories time and time again, which I am sure we all agree is a hugely difficult thing to do and extremely courageous. Uh, I too will join colleagues uh, in paying tribute to MST, MSPs, past and present, who have worked on this issue and brought us to this point, uh, particularly Jackson Carlaw, uh, Alex Neal and Neil Finlay. I thought the convener of the committee, Gillian Martin, spoke powerfully when she said that this bill couldn't and doesn't undo the trauma uh, and that trust in our health service for some has been irreparably damaged. I think what she said about choice and control for these women over their bodies and their lives is key to all of our considerations, whether in this bill or more widely on this issue. Indeed, as Deputy Convener of the Health, Social Care and Sport Committee, I commend the work of all those involved in scrutinising the bill and, like the Convener, thank all those who gave evidence, particularly those with lived experience who were supported by the Alliance. Sandesh Gohani spoke of the fact that many women simply haven't been believed for such a long time. And I think he is right to highlight the fact that many uh, took extraordinary action in order to fund their treatment, spending savings or taking costly loans, anything really to stop the pain. In line with the consensus we find across this chamber, Scottish Labour are supportive of the overall aims and principles of the bill. My colleague Carol Mockin in opening spoke of the power of our democratic process and I think the duty upon all of us to use the power of this place for the good of those we represent. Alex Cole Hamilton uh, echoed this, I think, in his powerful recollections of how Parliament has approached this issue over the years. Indeed, we've heard many powerful stories from colleagues this afternoon on how, um, how the experience has impacted their constituents. Stuart McMillan spoke of Michelle and raised the issues of the lengths women have gone to in order to fund treatment. 
And I think he made a very important point about crowdfunding, which was echoed by Craig Hoy. And it's clear that further clarity is required for women who funded treatment via this route or, or other fundraising routes. And indeed, the committee has called for that clarity from the Cabinet Secretary. So I do hope he might uh, begin to address that in uh, closing. Uh, David Torrens spoke of the life-changing, or indeed, uh, very sadly, the life-ending experience of his constituent, uh, where she felt that her life had come to an end. Uh, I think it was very difficult for us to hear that this afternoon, as Pam Gosell uh, alluded to, but I think it brought into sharp focus the reality of so many. Siobhan Brown, I think, did similar in telling Isabel's story. And I hope that whatever else we do in this place, we always seek to do anything we can to, at the very least, make life more livable for any woman affected. My colleague Katie Clark uh, and indeed Alex Cole Hamilton raised the issue of the use of MESH in other procedures and referenced other petitions before this Parliament. And I do believe that these merit the attention of the Cabinet Secretary, and I'm sure he will want to reflect on that uh, more widely uh, as we move forward. I think it's clear from today's debate that whilst the principles of the bill enjoy broad support, further clarity is required in some areas as we move forward in the bill's process. Uh, I welcome the Cabinet Secretary's response, uh, as Gillian Mackay and other members of the committee did, uh, on the issue around residency requirements. And I do hope that he will look at the timeline requirements, as he has committed to do uh, in his opening. Uh, Ms Mackay also referenced the so-called in-betweeners uh, and referred to my colleague Jackie Bailey, uh, who made the point at committee when attending as my substitute. I, I think that, th that the point is that we want a system where no one is left behind. Uh, and uh, I think that point has been well made across the chamber this afternoon. Uh, and indeed, I'm sure the Cabinet Secretary will cover that in summing up. Martin Whitfield, I think, posed um, just at the close of the open debate some important questions uh, for the Cabinet Secretary around waiting times. Uh, around uh, mesh, mesh removal and indeed the protests that are occurring today in Glasgow. And I know that he will also want to say something on that in concluding uh, in order to give confidence to Martin Whitfield and to colleagues that these issues are being looked at uh, very much in the round. Uh, and again, that we are trying to get it right um, for absolutely anyone who has been affected by these issues. Uh, in concluding, Deputy Presiding Officer, um, we should do all we can, I think, to hold on to the consensus that has been established, not only today uh, in the debate around this bill, but I think over the many years leading uh, to this point. We must acknowledge that there is more to do, and we must never forget the pain and suffering that has been caused, the duty that we have in this place to make an attempt at reparation, and the courage of those women who have fought despite their own trauma to try and bring light to a very dark experience in the history of our health service and to try and ensure that this should never happen again. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed, uh, Mr O'Kane. Uh, given the time in hand, uh, I invite Jackson Carlo to wind up for a generous seven minutes. Uh, thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. And can I start by saying that I genuinely feel a considerable pride in our Parliament this afternoon. Uh, and not without some emotion contributing to this debate. Over three parliaments, three sessions, eight long years, we have tried to bring forward and bring justice to the women who have survived the MESH scandal. Had it been, as I observed in an earlier debate, um, similar to the thalidomide uh, scandal, where the injuries and injustice suffered were all too visible, then it might have been easier to get this issue thoroughly discussed. But in the early days of this parliament, uh, when it first arose, I have to say there was a squeamishness and a reticence to actually talk about what was the most sensitive of issues for many women. Uh, and it was the heroism of those women. And frankly, and mention has been made of Alec Neil and Neil Finlay and myself, our determination actually to speak in the bluntest and most graphic way possible in order to break through this reticence to have people understand just how important it was that Parliament faced up to this issue. So while Shakespeare might have sent Mark Antony uh, to bury Caesar and not to praise him, I'm, I'm, of course, would never suggest I would 
ever talk about uh, burying the Cabinet Secretary. I mean, he can scooter himself to disaster all on his own, as we know. Uh, but I am here to praise him quite unequivocally this afternoon, not only for fulfilling the commitment of his uh, predecessor, Gene Freeman, in bringing this bill to Parliament after five health secretaries have wrestled with the issue, but also actually, I think, in the way he addressed the issues uh, in his opening speech this afternoon, the flexibility that he has shown and the willingness he has had to meet with the women concerned and with others who have pointed out uh, concerns they might have with the bill and his determination to see all those addressed at stage two. And I take all that at face value and really look forward to helping in any way I can uh, to facilitate the progress of this bill. It's not the end of the mesh argument, as people have pointed out. Uh, Professor Alison Britton is undertaking a full mesh case review. Uh, the Baroness Cumberledge's uh, recommendations still require to be implemented in full. And the Petitions Committee at the moment is considering a fresh petition on the wider application of mesh. Although, as the Minister has identified, we shouldn't just draw an immediate parallel between the use of mesh and other procedures and the particular issues that arose as a result of the transvaginal mesh scandal. Um, but that did lead to this fundamental uh, concern about what women in Scotland were being told. And mention has been made of Neil Finlay. He's been texting me during this debate. I did ironically ask him if that constituted lobbying, which I hope will be uh, not, not lost on other, on other colleagues. But when the Cabinet Secretary made reference to the Glasgow Centre, um, who have maybe done about two or three dozen mesh removals, uh, there is this concern of the women and of those of us who've been involved with this issue. What exactly was their training? Where were they trained? In what removal techniques have people in the Glasgow Centre been trained? And by whom were they subsequently accredited to be competent in those practices? Because it was those same women... Yes, of course. Martin. Very grateful, Jackson Carroll, for taking my intervention. Do you not think it also points to a wider issue about women not being believed when they come forward with health issues? And this is you know, something that we should be looking at in the round as well, more generally. Well, yes, Jackson I absolutely Carl. do. And I sat along, I think, with David Torrance when we heard evidence um, in committee, right back in the petitions committee, where one fundamental specialist said that only a couple of women were involved, with 60 women sitting behind him while he said it. There really has been a fundamental disconnect. And mention has been made of Elaine Holmes, who brought forward the petition in the first instance, uh, who said, I'd been discharged from NHS Greater Glasgow and Clyde after two mesh removal attempts. I was told I was mesh free and that I'd likely lose my leg if I had any more surgery relating to the trans or mesh implant. I did every test scan possible and had exhausted all options. After much research and pleading from my family, I contacted Dr. Veronicus as he was last, my last hope. Thank God I did. He removed 22 centimetres of offending mesh, having been told that all her mesh had already been removed. And that is why the women, so many of them, have confidence in Dr. Veronicus, who contacted me today ahead of this debate. And I don't want to note, introduce any note of, of, of difficulty, but here's what he said in conclusion of a letter that he has sent to the Interim Medical Director of NHS Scotland Procurement, Commissioning and Facilities today. Respectfully, he says, I see no progress, I only see delays and detours. As stated in my email on October the 28th, I do not believe we have made any progress since March 2019, when Terry O'Kelly first contacted me or since First Minister Nicola Sturgeon personally called me. The solution is either expedite and facilitate the care of the suffering women who wish my services or just tell them that NHS Scotland cannot help them receive care outside of Scotland. He goes on uh, to say that he is desperate for what appears to be a slightly dead hand of bureaucracy in trying to drill down to the details that we need to overcome this, and it probably does need the Cabinet Secretary to take a personal interest in what is being done, possibly in his name, to ensure that we get to the point where Dr Dionysius Veronicus believes he has got a contract which is fair and operable and allows these women to go to Missouri to have the treatment concerned. Cabinet Secretary. Can I, can I thank Jackson Carlo uh, for, for coming? We have seen uh, Dr Veronicus's response. I should say we actually had a helpful response from him just recently. Uh, so I think there is progress being made, but I can give an absolute assurance of two things. One, that I do personally take an interest in and involved in this issue, and if it means speaking to Dr Veronicus personally, of course, I would do that. But the, for the women involved, I also want to give an absolute assurance 
uh, that we respect Dr Veronica's expertise. And, uh, of course, if that is their choice, uh, then, of course, a woman's choice in any, uh, when it comes to the referral process, a woman's choice of where they want to get treated should be the absolute primary consideration going forward. And I thank the Cabinet yeah. Secretary for that assurance, and it is the delivery of that assurance that we've absolutely got to ensure follows the delivery of this bill. Can I thank Gillian Martin? I thought that was an incredibly comprehensive uh, contribution that actually detailed some of the residual questions. And I think she's absolutely right. There are some women who have maybe not yet declared the fact that they are people who would like to have mesh removed, or others who may not yet be uh, aware of the bill. And so, like Martin Whitfield and others, I think we have got to be careful about the date that we actually identify as the cut-off date for any procedures or application for procedure in future. I'd also like to thank all of the other contributors to the bill. David Torrance, the veteran of that long exchange in the committee, Katie Clark, Gillian Mackay, Craig Hoy, Kokab Stewart, and Siobhan Brown, who brought us uh, Isabel's experience. A typical, unfortunately, all too typical example of what many of the women have endured. I really do want to finally thank, at this last minute of the debate, both Alec Neal and Neil Finlay, Rona Mackay, Angus MacDonald, David Stewart, former colleagues of ours, Joanne Lamont, and the presiding officer who was in the chair earlier, all who did terrific work in promoting this issue over the last three parliaments. Elaine Holmes, Olive McElroy, Lorna Farrell, Claire Daisley, Karen Neal, Nancy Honeyball, Gillian Watt, Isabel McLafferty, all women I've been proud to stand with. These women have got the most affection and love for one another, uh, attending their Christmas dinners where they were an absolute mutual support in ensuring that the morale of these women was sustained and that their efforts were sustained. But let's not also forget Michelle McDougall, who died of cancer. She couldn't get chemotherapy because of the consequences of six previous hernia mesh operations. And Eileen Baxter, the first woman to have the removal of mesh, uh, mesh as the cause of death on our death certificate. This isn't just something women are still currently enduring. This is something that has led to the deaths of some women. It's opened up questions about how women are believed in health. It led to many women who at the start didn't believe there was hope for them, but fought to stop this happening to other women, fighting for years through their pain. And this bill now offers them the justice they deserve. Thank you very much indeed, Mr. Carlo. I, I know Neil Finlay is still making interventions from, if not a sedentary, then a remote position. Uh, fortunately, he'll not be able to raise points of order through a similar route. Uh, and I call on the Minister to conclude the debate for around eight, minister, uh, eight minutes, Minister. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I'm pleased to have the opportunity to close today's debate. I think it's important, firstly, to recognise and acknowledge the efforts of all the women who've campaigned for better services for those with complications from mesh surgery. Their dedication and fortitude has been ab admirable. I hope that all of the improvements the Cabinet Secretary described earlier will mean that women now will have access to more of the help that they need. The intention of the bill we are discussing today is therefore, I hope, clear. We want to ensure fairness for those whom, for whom those options were not available in the past and who paid for their treatment out of their own pocket. As I turn now to some of the detail that we've discussed today, I want to thank all of the members who've contributed to this afternoon's debate. I think what is clear is that although some members have quite rightly raised some important points and have asked some probing questions, we all want the same thing. We want to ensure that we do right by these women who have suffered. And like the Cabinet Secretary, I would like to extend my thanks to the Health and Sport and Social Care Committee for their consideration and support of the general principles of the Bill. I fully appreciate that women will be frustrated at the length of time between the Government's announcement and the successful, of the successful bidders on the 12th of July and the final contracts being agreed. And I can assure you that, that NHS National Services Scotland is working hard to finalise those arrangements as quickly as possible. And I'm sure you'll all understand, however, that there is a balance to be struck between concluding the agreements quickly and making sure that all aspects of wraparound and emergency care are provided for in those agreements. However, as indicated by the Cabinet Secretary, the Government will consider this matter further and intends to confirm its position about a cut-off date at Stage 2, should the Parliament agree to this bill at Stage 1. In his response to the Stage 1 report, the Cabs Cabinet Secretary is committed to considering the issue of residency further as well and bringing forward an appropriate amendment to the bill at Stage 2. 
The Cabinet Secretary has also agreed in his response to the Stage 1 report to provide the Committee with a draft of the reimbursement scheme. And that draft will provide in detail um, in, in relation to the meaning of the term arranged, while still showing the scheme administrators flexibility to take into account the individual circumstances. The Government considers this approach preferable to delay in making regulations. It is intended that the scheme will be administered by the NHS National Services Scotland, who already administer the MESH Fund. And the Government will work closely with NHS NSS in the coming months as we make more detailed plans for administration. NSS will be given sufficient resources to manage the scheme effectively. The intention of the Bill is to reimburse the full cost of surgery, along with reasonable travel and accommodation costs for both the person undergoing surgery and for a person who travelled with them as support. However, it is not anticipated that the reimbursement will be given for luxury accommodation, for example, or first-class travel, and that is why there is a caveat about reasonable costs. For other expenses, such as food, the intention is to give women a choice over whether they want to evidence their costs or are able to evidence their costs, or instead want to receive a capped rate per person per day. That is to ensure the flexibility that we all agree is important here and is in direct response to feedback from women who told us they want a straightforward process. Um, a number of um, people raised the issue of crowdfunding and donations from family. The purpose of the scheme is not to reimburse those who donated money to help someone with the cost of surgery. So the government doesn't intend to reimburse monies received through online fund funding platforms such as crowdfunding, where it would be difficult or indeed impossible to identify the donor in any case where the donor would not have expected repayment. It is the intention that applicants will be asked to declare any such monies on their application form and their reimbursement payment will be reduced accordingly. Further consideration has been given to the matter of money received informally from friends and family members. And on reflection, the government feels it would be unreasonable to request details of private arrangements. Accordingly, applicants will not be asked to declare these donations when making an application to the scheme. It is, of course, then up to individuals to repay any monies received as they see fit. The Government will make every effort to ensure that those who are eligible to apply for reimbursement are made aware of the scheme. Um, the issue of qualifying surgery came up during the debate. and it, The qualifying surgery does have to have had the principal purpose of wholly or partially removing the mesh, um, but that is regardless of the outcome. We expect to take um, undertake a range of methods to publicise the scheme, including press releases, social media, through the Alliance and NHS Inform. The bill requires that the scheme is laid before Parliament and published. Um, on the Glasgow Centre, we fully recognise that GPs and other local clinical staff need to be aware not only that the service in NHS Greater Glasgow and Clyde exists, but also of what it offers in terms of services so that they are then able to explain this to women who present with MESH complications. Health Board accountable officers for MESH have been involved in the development of the centre and have a continuing role to play in ensuring that local health boards are aware of the service and what it can offer. The National Specialist Mesh Removal Centre has been and will continue to be developed with patient and public input. And the pathway of care will continue to be a key focus for the government. It must take into account the patient experience. Nursing specialists and physiotherapists from the Specialist Centre are linked with their counterparts and local health boards to, in, to ensure continuity from PD to post operative care. The Government has asked the Health and Social Care Alliance to take forward work on developing a patient-focused map of the care pathway, and that will be created from a patient perspective, which will help future patients to understand the referral process and what it means for them. Now, we all know that COVID-19 has had a significant impact on our health services across Scotland, and it's meant that health boards weren't always able to run out patient clinics or provide other services within the sort of timescales that we'd want and expect expect. We absolutely acknowledge that this means that some women have regrettably had to wait far longer than we would ever wish to wait to be assessed in um, the service in Glasgow. Regarding Martin Whitfield's question, I understand that there are around 17 women um, waiting for surgery in Glasgow. I believe Glasgow clinicians were due to confirm that figure to the committee, but their correspondence is not yet noticed, noted on the um, committee's website. 
I want to give our assurances that we are absolutely fully committed to working with NHS NSS and, and the National Specialist Mesh Removal Centre to look at ways to improve the speed of referral and um, processing through the, the Glasgow Centre. On the issue of hernia mesh removal, which was raised by a number of people, um, including Mr Cole Hamilton, he's correct that it's out with the scope of this bill. Uh, Jackson Carlow um, referenced my appearance at the Petitions Committee, and where I made clear that there, there were, while there were some common ground, um, there, isn't, there aren't necessarily, the, 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 there isn't exactly the same situation arising from the use of mesh um, in other areas. The evidence was presented at the Petitions Committee and at present the Government doesn't consider that there is evidence that might justify a pause in the use of the relevant devices. And, and to summarise, in January 2020 the Scottish Health Technologies Group published their report which examined the use of mesh in primary and guinal her hernia repair in men. And that concluded that compared to non-mesh procedures, using mesh actually resulted in lower rates of recurrence, fewer serious adverse events, and similar or lower risk of chronic pain. And the SHTG is currently undertaking further work on the topic of hernia repair in men. Um, the, a report on that is expected imminently and once we have a copy of that report we'll consider the recommendations and share that with relevant officials and health boards, specialist associations and of course the petitions committee and I committed during my appearance that I would um, re-attend the committee should that be helpful. On the issue of other gynaecological uses of, of mesh, at the same time the halt on transvaginal mesh was introduced, the then CMO introduced a high vigilance protocol for the use of mesh in other sites. Um, and that um, resulted um, in the appointment of accountable officers who are responsible for oversight of that protocol um, and who have continued to meet regularly to improve services for those affected by MESH. It's really important that we note that these are complex and long established procedures and there are very few, if any, viable alternatives. But it's absolutely crucial that the most stringent safety measures are adopted with patients fully aware of the risks and benefits of such a procedure before deciding on their treatment. Um, Jackson Carlow mentioned the, um, uh, in fact, I think it was Neil Finlay who, who mentioned the introduction of a, a GMC approved credential and mesh removal sur surgery. And the Scottish Government wrote to both the Royal College of Obstetricians and Gynaecologists and the GMC to express our support for the introduction of a GMC approved credential and mesh removal surgery. And as specialist centres are established across the UK, Credentialing will define the skills required to perform mesh removal surgery and to set out how these skills can be acquired and assessed. And by formally recognising the skills of our surgeons, credentialing will provide assurance for patients and the service and will reduce the risk of harm and will help to improve public confidence. Um, I agree a number, of, a number of members raised the issue uh, that the way that women were not listened to in relation to mesh and I would agree that it was indicative of a wider problem of health inequalities that women experience. And I believe that that is one of the reasons why we have brought forward the Women's Health Plan. It's ambitious, um, we're making tangible progress, but we have much to do. It's a starting point, not an end. Um, finally, do I have time to raise one final point that was raised in the debate? So in response to the Cumberland report, the Scottish Government called on the H um, Her Majesty's Government to consider the establishment of a redress agency that was funded by a levy on manufacturers. And HMG um, rejected that recommendation in their response, but they are still considering their position on redress in individual instances. Presiding officer. On behalf of the Cabinet Secretary and myself, I would like once again to thank all of those who have contributed to bringing the bill to this point. Looking ahead, I look forward to detailed scrutiny in Stage 2, where the points raised by members today can be considered. And we'll also reflect on the debate today here in finalising our approach to Stage 2. We know that work still needs to be done to rebuild women's trust in the services available here in Scotland. We hope that the work currently being undertaken by the Government and by NHS Scotland to improve the care offered will help to restore women's confidence in the services available here. 
But for those who wish to be treated elsewhere, we're working to ensure that there is a clear referral pathway to either a specialist centre in NHS England or to an independent provider. And in order to ensure that anyone who has previously paid for private mesh removal surgery, that they will not be financially disadvantaged, the government considers it fair and reasonable to have in place a scheme which will allow these women to apply for reimbursement of this past costs. I therefore commend the general principles of the bill to Parliament. Thank you. That concludes the debate on the Transvaginal Mesh Removal Cost Reimbursement Scotland Bill. It is now, now time to move on to the next item of business which is consideration of motion 2167 on a financial resolution for the Transvaginal Mesh Removal Cost Reimbursement Scotland Bill. And I call on Marie Todd to move the motion. Moved. Thank you, Minister. The question on this motion will be put at decision time. The next item of business is consideration of business motion 2251 in the name of George Adam on behalf of the Parliamentary Bureau setting out a business programme and I call on George Adam to move the motion. Move the officer. Thank you Minister. No member has asked to speak on the motion and the question is that motion 2251 be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. The motion is therefore agreed. The next item of business is consideration of nine Parliamentary Bureau motions and I ask George Adam on behalf of the Parliamentary Bureau to move motions 2252 to 2259 on approval of SSIs and 2260 on designation of a lead committee. All moved, presiding officer. Thank you, Minister. The question on these motions will be put at decision time. Yes, I am. Um, I am minded to accept a motion without notice under Rule 11.2.4 of Standing Orders that decision time be brought forward to now, and I invite a member of the Parliamentary Bureau to move the motion. The Minister for Parliamentary Business. Move, presiding officer. Thank you, Minister. The question is that decision time be brought forward to now. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. There are three questions to be put as a result of today's business. The first is that motion 2234 in the name of Hamza Youssef on the Transvaginal Mesh Removal Cost Reimbursement Scotland Bill be agreed. Are we all agreed? The motion is therefore agreed. The next question is that motion 2167 in the name of Kate Forbes on a financial resolution for the Transvaginal Mesh Removal Cost Reimbursement Scotland Bill be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. The motion is therefore agreed. And I propose to ask a single question on nine Parliamentary Bureau motions. Does any member object? No member objects. The final question, therefore, is that motions 2252 to 2260 in the name of George Adam on behalf of the Parliamentary Bureau be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. The motion is therefore agreed. That concludes decision time and we will now move on to members' business.